Water is the king of solvents. Any Schling who has studied basic science in the past knows that, which is why we know better than to get within a meter of the stuff without full protective gear. Just a few drops burn like putting your arms in the sun. When you come into contact with it, it melts through the densest parts of your crystal carus as easily as if you had put it on your sensory spindles or vacuum cleaners. There are stories of secret teams of warriors, clans, and explorers using needles dipped in water to carve signs of courage and honor into their bodies. But that only talks about the barracks. They do not play with a period of water. Even with these smooth gas bags, the Trari know better than playing with them. A drop will burn us, but it kills. They go directly through these sensitive grids. Water is death. We know it, and our neighbors know it, but I guess no one bothered to tell the people. Oh, don't blink your optic nodes. You weren't there at first contact. I was just trying to imagine being sent to hell. It's a green-blue world. They must wrap themselves in a class 7 protective cocoon because the rock is covered to the brim with water. It really can come out of nowhere, but it will be okay. You think to yourself, all you have to do is check a measurement, and then you can blast its driest climbs so you exit the needle ship along with your three fellow explorers, barely able to move in your cocoons, but knowing that they are the only ones protecting all four of your feet from the hundreds of puddles everywhere. So you crawl each step carefully and carefully, always careful not to take any action that might tear or break the cocoon. And then you climb a hill to see a huge, undulating pool of bright blue liquid death with these four creepy things splashing around in it like it's Christ dust. Yes, that's how we found them, folks. They call it swimming when you voluntarily take off all your protective gear and dive into a big body of water. Then you just move. You're not hurting yourself. They think it's funny. Oh, you think it's crazy? One of the scientists told me that not only do they like bouncing in the water, they need it to survive. Their bodies are filled with this nightmare fluid. So never fight with someone if you can break that bulbous thing. They call it the nose, and you'll still get burned if that internal fluid gets on you. KTH immediately thinks they're dying and starts staggering toward them with a first aid kit. I try to grab her with my arms before she can do something stupid, but she's always faster than me. She's in sight of the aliens before I can tell her what I saw with my long-range optics. It's a strange cosmic coincidence that no matter how different humans are, we have one thing in common. We both smile. Oh, it's a strange kind of smile, all dull calcium formations and our grins blindingly sharp. But you could say it's the same thing, or at least I could yell, attack down the hill, narrowly avoiding a handful of jagged rocks that would have torn her cocoon open and exposed her to the air. But her luck is on her side. People, stop smiling and get out of the water when they see them. I can imagine what they were thinking. Out of nowhere, a piece of living crystal, wrapped in a metal net, emerges. It marches towards you on four pillar-like legs, with four more arms waving wildly alien machines. We were lucky that these human scouts were foolhardy when they reached their passage and finally noticed that the water was simply flowing from their spongy bodies. Strangely soft bodies, they did not dissolve at all. She stood frozen in place while the rest of us slowly advanced in what we hoped would be a peaceful manner. People quickly pulled out their own suits, some of them grabbing weapons, but they slowed down when they realized this. We had stopped approaching them. Good thing too. I don't like fighting an enemy with water flowing through them. Not that I knew at the time it took work to calibrate our respective translators, but eventually we managed it. Their ship was the anomaly we had spotted. It was a mapped border world, but uselessly covered up because it was doomed blue to the humans. It was prime real estate. They were there to explore the planet in hopes of colonizing it for their federation. Humans always seek out planets with water. Remember, they actually need that stuff to live. That's why our diplomats get along so well with them. They want a world filled with liquid death, while we're all too happy to find a nice barren rock to build our lattice cities on. I'd have been happy never to see one again. Just the thought of a living, talking, walking bag of melt juice coming near me gave me the crinkly guess that in the past cycle I was one bladed shard because out of all my scout team, I'm the one that got assigned to the ambassadorial spindle ship as a special advisor honor guard, you're finding this hard to believe. But the ambassador believed me even less. When I met him, we talked in detail before the start of the mission. He invited me to his chic office, which was decorated with stalactites, which were sculpted by famous crystal forms, and offered me some opals to eat in a real Tarana dish. 
I could immediately say that he had years of experience as a diplomat because he never described me directly as a liar who had just been proposed. I may remember things for a dramatic effect. People talked a lot about their homeland. I guess they missed her as much as I did. Texia. They talked endlessly about the clean air, the vast blue oceans, and the lush greenery. They explained that their planet was home to hundreds of species. They talked about how much they missed freshly cooked food and hard liquor. I can't believe I forgot to mention the most amazing thing. These people, they regularly consumed water or water-based compounds directly. I couldn't help but wonder if the oceans were all made of water. Of course, they like all kinds. Almost all life on Earth is partly made of water. They were not peculiarities that came to evolutionary dominance because of a freak feature that everything on the planet had water. In the, I asked if water had ever killed a person, and I felt a bit of ease when I heard that, but only when it hid their breathing systems. She could also kill water, but that was not because of the water but because other chemicals had been tainted. Otherwise, the water was used everywhere for everything. One of the humans even told me, it was their most common resource. I was a bit hung up on the subject. I admit I relayed all of this to the ambassador, who offered me a crystalline smile and told me he had checked the coordinates the humans had given me for their home world. He said it had been surveyed centuries ago by our first attempts at long range. Scouting the historic first generation right class sensor probe, shortly before its systems failed completely and it disintegrated into space debris, Probe number 2295 passed over a planet with a nitrogen-rich atmosphere. The position given was approximately the same as this Earth. The probe was said to have detected no liquid water during its brief passage over the planet, but it did detect vapor dispersed in the atmosphere. The ambassador said it was clear that the humans had exaggerated to appear more ferocious to an alien, given what the probe had deemed likely. The humans had some sort of resistance to the water from the vapors present in the atmosphere of their planet, they could probably survive a few minutes, perhaps an hour, of contact before experiencing any ill effects from the liquid water, and that is what I saw. However, there was no way they could be completely immune or even dependent on the substance, as I had suggested it would fly in the face of hundreds of years of tri backslash biological science. I wanted to tell him to just look at the medical data before I realized it. We didn't have everything my team knew. We knew from talking to the humans we had literally only just met. There had been no formal exchange of scientific literature that was yet to come. The only files we had received were a list of communication options and what we needed to know for the diplomatic mission. We didn't have the faster-than-light communication technology that humans had, and the humans exploring this watery planet had long gone home to deal with their own ambassadors. I idly wondered if their chief scout wasn't trying to explain to his overly soaked boss how he had encountered a race of perfectly dry aliens who were afraid of what they were swimming in. The thought comforted me a little. The ambassador assured me that everything would be fine. He had selected our best construction teams, who would take the most durable of our crystal seeds to build our embassy, and everyone would be given extra protective cocoons. Of course, even if the steam concentration was high, we could live in our protective cocoons for a few days while the embassy took root and the construction teams hollowed out interior chambers. These could be shielded from the tiny water particles. I remembered someone talking about how often water fell from the sky. The planet we met on reminded him of a place called Seattle. I shuddered and tried to explain again that things wouldn't be that easy. Humans had intentionally explored a planet with a ridiculously high water content for colonization purposes. Why would they be looking for water when it was as deadly to them as it was to everyone else? Well, you know how high-ranking officials like to be fooled. The crystalline smile tore, and I was sent back to my rooms to finish. Two cycles later, I joined the ship of the Ambassador Spindle, and I wondered if it was not too late to request the transfer of the trip to Earth, which was actually quite pleasant. If you can climb high enough on the rows, you can travel to a spit one day after three tours and quarters on a narrow needle ship with a room for me, which is worth it. The daily briefs on what we do on Earth were certainly boring, but I get used to endless briefings as a scout. As soon as the preparation of the mission has been completed, it was a busy week with little to do except rest or play games of Shatter Spike with the rest of the crew. Oh, and the food. Those opals in his office were just the beginning. The ambassador had brought his personal chef along for the mission, and he didn't skimp on the provisions. 
I didn't even see a single dust ration in the entire galley. It was like a long vacation that ended all too quickly when the approach horn sounded, signaling that a return to real space was imminent. I made sure to be on the bridge at that moment because I wanted to see the ambassador's face when the planet appeared on the screen. It was as close to an apology as I could ever get. The pilot had done his job masterfully. We returned to real space directly into high Earth orbit. It was a small maneuver meant to impress those Earthlings with the precision of our ship's navigation systems, but it almost backfired spectacularly. Earth's orbit was littered with satellites and spacecraft, as well as an orbital ring connected to the planet below by 10 narrow strands that our sensors recognized as space elevators. The Earthlings knew we were coming, so we weren't afraid of being shot at, but we also didn't expect to have to take immediate evasive action because of a waterfall. Once the initial chaos passed and we were in a safe, stable orbit, far from space debris or a squadron of ships, we had our first glimpse of Earth. I locked sensors directly on the ambassador's face and felt the purest vindication. I have felt it since I became a senior scout. He was absolutely shaking from the shock of the planet. Ahead of us was a rich night atmosphere. The shore and the planet were also covered with water, depending on the panel computer. The swirling clouds visible on the view screen were heavy with things in places that easily recognized the sensors in several areas of the world. The frozen water was strongly concentrated on the two poles and in our long distance at high distance in two glacial caps. The visual scanner even managed to take pictures of people in the water, as they had done on this other planet. I looked at the immense sapphire so long ago, and I found it beautiful. Despite the danger, I knew what it meant. The ambassador issued a massifying sound and only managed to fold the probes, which broke with triple broken probes, but obviously I knew that something like that would happen. You see, every explorer veteran knows what I know better than to tell our ambassador to his office. The first generation of Reiki sensor probes were pieces of waste that should never have been put to use. A whole third of them were sent to them alone because the defective sensors read so much energy. He turned to zero and thought. They had found a world that was completely barren. The rest had a 50-50 chance of having unusable data, and the only reason it was being used was because not using it would have been a huge sin to the bureaucrats in power who had appointed them. The ambassador was still shaking as the communications reached the people. It was standard fare, a welcome you hear a hundred times when dealing with bureaucrats and their little ceremonies. However, the ambassador needed a moment before he could respond. His spindles were still staring at the deadly blue ball displayed on the screen. There was silence for a moment, and the human representative started to repeat the message before the ambassador begged his pardon and gave his own greeting credit, where it backslashes due. The cracked old boulder managed to recover beautifully from that little gaffe. The humans talked with him for hours, hashing out preliminary agreements, exchanging basic information, and negotiating the terms of our establishment of an embassy on their planet. And that's where the fun started. The humans had a handful of cities where their diplomats gathered. All of them were on the coast or near large bodies of water. The ambassador tried his best to find a way to establish our embassy somewhere drier. There were many fine deserts on the planet, but they were of no use. Half the point of an embassy was to have diplomats nearby and other diplomats where deals could be brokered and agreements made. The embassy would have to be established in one of the humans' dangerously moist cities. The ambassador made a plea that, since all the rest of the galaxy found water deadly, a fully diplomatic settlement should be established somewhere drier, perhaps in orbit or on the moon. Then the human representative shocked us by telling us that was not the case. Apparently, we were not the first extraterrestrials they had struck. They had found two other civilizations. We had never met. Civilizations were more like us, and our ambassador was surprised by the idea that there was more than a garden of liquid consumption in carbon there. Some of me wanted to ask him after hundreds of years of biological science from TT Backslash. He mentioned that I was home. The rest of me had no desire to be ejected from an airlock. The first of these new aliens were the Verks, and I must admit that I had not understood that they were a separate species. At first, they looked like humans to me. Fleshy, watery bodies, calcium deposits, teeth, and a network of tiny threads called hair. It was only later, at another mandatory meeting, that I was taught to pay attention to small differences, like the number of fingers, the eyes, and the shape of the ears. This was also when I learned that humans arrived in many colors, 
but not blue, green, or purple, which were only slightly more pleasant to be around because they were not even so fond of water. Although they shared humans' immunity to it, even if their biology was based on it, the leaders had evolved on a series of planets that were much drier than what we were trying to build. Embassy. I almost envied the diplomatic team that was assigned to their home in the desert. An infinite expanse of sand and splendid metal cities where all the water was underground and exploited by wells. We must never see the virtues, who seemed to envy how their human guests were so comfortable with water. An interesting strangeness of ver biology made them completely unable to swim. They all sink like stones. I would still prefer sinking to melting, but I wouldn't tell them that Moody Lot, those Verks, the second alien species the humans had encountered, were the Tolets, and they really confused me. At first glance, I thought we might find other crystalline life forms on this wet rock, but that was not the case, as their bodies were rather hard rather than fleshy. This was due to a thick exoskeleton protecting a truly grotesque internal system of goose organs. The Toots were not immune to water like the Verks and humans. They resisted only thanks to their exoskeleton. They were also reluctant to talk, because that's all I learned about them, one by one. The ambassador's attempts to locate our embassy in a more hospitable place failed until we accepted the inevitable. So I found myself in another protective cocoon and was sent with the construction teams to build the crystalline air of the embassy. We are a few kilometers from the substance that could destroy us. The ambassador remained with most of the crew on board the spindle ship. I argued that I should be there with him in the context of the Guard of Honor. He replied that someone had to protect manufacturers in difficulty and was more than enough to protect them on board his own ship. I couldn't help but wonder if I was being punished for being right. The guard duty was okay. At first, I stood as still as a stone on the perimeter and chased away any curious people who came through the security cordon. The humans were already set up around our construction site. I couldn't decide if it was out of consideration for our workers or paranoia about our ambassador pushing them to do this, but I was just glad to have him. He made my job very easy for the first few days. Then I discovered what a dog was. Remember how people talked about hundreds of species who love water on their planet when I met them for the first time? Well, dogs were one of their main employees. Apparently, the dogs were with humanity for thousands of years and looked faithfully in different roles. They were a common face in most human cities, and security was probably made to prevent other people from making a mess. No one probably noticed the little dog had slipped in, at least not until he approached the poor girl in the middle of planting. I can still see the foundation crystal. The dog trotted on all fours and didn't even reach Chalet's waist. The first joint made a strange noise. Later, I was told that it was called barking, and I approached Gurkil Lid, who carefully put down his crystal and looked at the little animal. The dog didn't seem scared at all. Maybe we were so different from everything else on the planet. It didn't think we were alive. Maybe it was so used to being safe in the city. He no longer registered danger. Maybe it was too friendly anyway, looking at him and he begins to lick his leg, his stirring tail. In the way I said to myself, I indicated that it was happy that Shone let him lick curious to see this extraterrestrial life closely. Then the little dog's tongue drags over a tiny crack in Grail's protective cocoon, one he probably didn't even notice while he was working. Remember that all beasts on Earth have water flowing through them. They can hurt you without ever meaning to do so. I grinned, screamed in pain, and stumbled backwards. The dog's tongue had dissolved the small piece of exposed carapace. The little dog howled in fear and ran away out of sight. Several human soldiers rushed in with weapons raised, looking for a terrorist or criminal who wasn't there. The other workers panicked and drew their tools, nearly knocking me over as they tried to get behind me for protection. I screamed as loud as I could. It's just an animal. You giant pebbles, get out of my way now. As an explorer, I had a medical background and doubted that human security would know how to treat T's wound. I got to grill it fairly quickly and checked his injury. It was not bad, but it looked very painful. He'd probably be good to work in a day. But this was our first injury from an earth animal. The ship's doctor calls down to put him in quarantine almost immediately. I tried to explain to the doctor that, without an embassy, 
quarantine is going to mean going back aboard the ship. I can almost hear a fight in the background between the doctor and the ambassador before I'm told to double wrap with another protective cocoon and then escort Grilla to the infirmary for treatment and observation. I thought, when I say I felt like a mummy, Gilla didn't get sick. Despite the paranoia of the ambassador, carbon bases cannot do anything about us, and our diseases can do anything to people. The doctor has still recorded everything because we have at least received some information about dangerous animals. From the incident, I always thought of all the people I had seen everywhere in the city with these animals, and every Terex who dared to leave the message would be in danger at a certain moment or a bad time. All the animals on Earth were dangerous, all of them. Why? Because, as I said before, there is water in every damn person. Even the little insects. One day, there was not a cloud in the sky, so some of the workers took off their protective cocoons. I saw a SWAT officer with a little bug called a fly, and the leftover substance he smeared on him had enough water in it to give that pebble head a nasty little carous. After that day, everyone always kept their protective cocoons. I remembered that my thoughts on the Earth ship were beautiful but deadly. I was later told that human security had caught the little dog and taken him away for observation. I think doctors think with the same brain regardless of species. However, unlike R, I heard that the dog had become very ill. Apparently our carcasses are easily dissolved by the Earth, but the animal saliva, the liquid that results from it, is quite poisonous. Fortunately for both the dog and the grilled, the dog only licked him a little, and they both made a full recovery. I didn't tell Grill about the dog, although he would have felt even worse if he knew that he had made a poor, stupid animal sick when it was just trying to be friendly. But maybe he should have thanked the little dog, because Grilled was still in the sickbay of the spindle ship. When the rains came, everyone knew that rainwater falling from the sky was something that happened on Earth. After the incident with the fly and the dog, the Bill teams took no chances. Their protective cocoons were ready, triple-checked for ruptures, and ready to keep the falling water out. Whenever it came, of course, our construction teams didn't anticipate the massive amount of rain that could fall on Earth, even with our protective cocoons. We huddled under what little part of the embassy we could build, and the water poured down. The howling wind carried the scorching rain toward us without regard for our protection. Lightning flashed across the city and gave us brief moments of fear, our cocoons held firm despite their illumination. Our preparations had not been in vain. All we had to do was wait. The minutes turned into hours, and even though the rain fell hard, it came and went and never went away. I began to wonder how long storms could last on Earth, wondered if the ambassador had been warned about the storms but didn't see fit to tell us, then wondered what would happen if my cocoon broke, the fleeting thought that I was about to come as close to being underwater as I would ever come the water falling like great curtains of death from the dark sky above, thunder and lightning long gone. I could barely hear the roar of the rain. I heard laughter from beyond the security barrier. A group of human children scurried past laughing, splashing each other with death fluid as they disappeared down the street with complete calm. I stared into the rain, and the sheer insanity of it almost made me scream. Here we were, a seasoned scout and several construction teams from Mighty Taraxia, having braved the threat on a dozen hostile planets, capable of deflecting M-cannon fire and tearing apart Class IV tanks with their bare claws, huddled together like shards of glass while human children laughed, danced, and played under the sky and tried to kill us. What a fearsome species these humans are. It was all good that TX and Earth were getting along. Any invasion of this place would be a death sentence. My thoughts were interrupted again by a very unwelcome sound. A soft hiss. I looked up and noticed that the rain falling down the sides of the glass panes above us had taken on a distinct rainbow sheen. My optics twitched as I shouted for the others to run and throw me into the rain as fast as they could. My cocoon immersed in the things I couldn't see. I stumbled forward, praying I wouldn't fall and tear the cocoon. I could hear the panicked screams of the construction crews as they tried to follow me, some understanding why others were still clueless. I crashed into the security cordon and one of the sentries on duty was shouting something at me in human language. I couldn't understand him in the rain, but I saw that his small shed would never be able to protect me and my team. I ignored him and rushed towards the row of buildings across the street. I could only see vague shapes and headed towards what I hoped was an entrance. 
I was wrong. I slammed into a rain-striped barrier and fell forward. I heard the glass shatter, felt my cocoon crack, felt the hundred tiny burns as a little rain came through, and then there was a brief moment of relief. As I slid into the building, my vision began to return as the dried pain of the cocoon hit me hard as the construction crew slipped and tripped against me. They all fell to the floor like two dozen crystalline meteorites. All around us were people in what I knew to be rank husks, some shouting and calling, some pointing, and some taking pictures with those damned handheld computers they have. Almost everyone drank. One of them had thrown her drink at Concern, who was crying as he tried to carry the little human, frightened by his unexpected and rather noisy arrival. The glass immediately shattered its protective cocoon. It screamed and roared as the liquid contents flowed down its front, but nothing hit the soup ports. There were many of them now, and the rain quickly took advantage of them. Everyone had a few inches of dissolved carapo in one area or another. Everyone was in pain, of course, as it turned out. We had literally interrupted a meeting of the human political elite. The building turned out to be a popular restaurant where people went to watch and drink during the storm. I heard this from several guards who had intervened in the rain, demanding to know what we were doing. I pulled myself up and started to explain, but I shouldn't have bothered. It was clear seconds later, a monstrous crash that sounded all too familiar, like the thunder that had previously ravaged the city. In the air, everyone turned towards the construction site, barely visible in the distance from the large window we were through, even with the pouring rain. And through the lack of sun, you could see the pile of crystal shards where the half-formed frame of our embassy had now stood. Those shards slowly began to melt under the persistent rain. The crystal seeds we brought with us for building were water-resistant, yes, but not immune to the few other water-infested planets. We felt the need to build on our crystalline. The buildings were designed to withstand a certain level of acceptable damage. They then regenerate over the course of a few days when the weather is dry and none of those planets have that much water to bombard them with. The massive amount of rain had overwhelmed the growing crystals until they broke under the stress. When the less resistant inner layers were exposed, the crystals began to melt. Water is a great solvent. To my pleasant surprise, the consequences of breaking a famous window surprisingly, the influence of a bunch of politicians turned out to be pretty low. I think it helped that we were all clearly injured by the rain and that our embassy was clearly destroyed. We were all taken back to the spindle ship, where our only real punishment was listening to the ambassador scream and rage that none of this would have happened if we had built faster. It was a fair trade to be far from so much water. The people took pity on us and offered to build our embassy. It was painful, but we had no choice but to accept that we had managed to save some of our pride, even if the ambassador made a joint effort a symbol of how our two peoples could work together. The people would build the outer shell of steel and concrete with special shutters on all the doors and windows. Once this waterproof shell was complete, we could move in and grow our crystals around the man-made structure, allowing us to build the interior without fear of a second storm. It worked great. The inside of the new embassy felt like we were back in Texas. All glass walls and furniture, the only metal coming from the latest generation of machines. The engineering teams went out, although every time there's a storm, I head for the deepest levels of the building, the inner chambers, where you just can't feel the water hitting that outer structure no matter how hard you try. The chances of another close encounter were slim to none, but I just didn't want to be reminded of that. I rolled dice every day. I was there HM. It's a little game with Earth. You know what? Never mind. I'll explain it another time. I faithfully served out the rest of my term on Earth and never set up a single sensor spindle outside the embassy unless I had to admit, despite everything, that the ambassador did a damn good job in the end. The series of agreements he signed with humans were the foundation of our current alliance. We gave the humans an abundance of deadly water and rich planets that they loved so much, and in return, they gave us an abundance of perfectly barren rocks to build on. It's a kind of symbiosis. I guess we can both use what the other can't, but being the ambassador's honor guard has turned out to be quite a prestigious position, prestigious or not. The first thing I did when I got home was apply for a job as an instructor instead of an active scout. Since then, I've had no more problems with water falling from the sky or seeing any cute, acid-colored creatures. No worries about frightened dignitaries. Fix me with their drinks. 
No nightmares about burst pipes. Oh, I didn't tell you about the pipes. I didn't learn them myself. Until the humans started building the outer shell of the embassy, every human city, no, every human building had water running all around it, where you can't see it. There's a network of pipes in the walls, floor, and ground carrying water here and there everywhere. They're pretty well made, so it's unlikely that one of them will burst and spray the area with water. But it's always a very small chance for humans, which is just an inconvenience for us. It's death. With just a tiny chance, you'll die anywhere. You go on Earth. Just another tiny chance to add to all the other tiny chances you'll be taking. If you go there anyway, it was the best decision I ever made. But if you really don't believe me about how much water they have on Earth, go over to the duty terminal. There are a number of roles we need to fill in the Turan Embassy. In fact, there are almost always openings. Don't you ever wonder why that is?